Um, thank you all for coming to what is now the IRENA online seminar series. Um, we're going to hear today about neutrinos from uh, stars. Uh, so, Frank, I'll let you take it away. Um, all right. And, yeah. Sharing screen. How's the view? Everybody got the view? If you don't know, there's usually a little uh, button near the top that um, will let you fit the view to your screen. So if for some reason you don't see the full screen, that's how you get to it. Okay, and we will begin. Uh, some new results on stellar neutrinos. So this is a body of work um, that has taken place at least over the last three years and as recently as this morning when we just got the positive referee report on um, a piece of the work. Okay, if you are not talking, probably you want to mute your microphone or the host can uh, enforce, a, enforce a mute. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, so this is uh, up until this morning, some recent stuff. Uh, and this has primarily been driven uh, by the people who are listed at least in the first, uh, uh, at least four there. Uh, so Eve Farag is a grad student at ASU, Manik, um, uh, Mukahap Badahi, and I hope I said that right, is also a grad student at ASU. Uh, Kelly Patton is currently at Colby. Uh, Rob Farmer is at Amsterdam. Morgan Taylor is a grad student at ASU. Uh, Chachilia is a faculty member at ASU. Kai Zuber is um, a faculty member at TU Dresden. And then I am merely a provocateur. Okay, so that's who's responsible for this work over the last couple of years. And just to give you a roadmap of where we're headed, I have 38 slides uh, on eight vignettes, uh, just to let you know where we're going. And so I'm gonna start off with, with two public service announcements. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about neutrino astronomy, neutrino production in stars, MESA, a neutrino HR diagram, probing pre-supernova isotopic, isotopic evolution, identifying the progenitor, pre-supernova progenitor, and then just a reminder that low mass stars count too. And so 38 slides divided by eight topics, and so each will be about four long or so. So first of two public service announcements. I certainly owe something to Burbage, Burbage, Valor and Hoyle intellectually. Uh, and so thank you, Margaret. Second public service announcement. Beetlejuice is still there, hasn't gone away, despite dimming and broadening. So this particular shot, uh, my screen is cut off on the bottom. There we go. <clears throat> so this particular shot was done uh, in December of 2019 when Beetlejuice is dimming and so you can see that uh, uh, Beetlejuice is approximately as, as bright as Albaden. Um, and so it's in its dim state. In normal state, it's much more like Rigel. Beelatrix, actually. Um, so the reason I mentioned Beetlejuice is not because it's been in the public news for a while, but because we're going to touch Beetlejuice a couple of times uh, as we go through this uh, new results on neutrinos. Okay, so over the next decade, neutrino astronomy will probe the rich astrophysics of neutrino production in the sky. In addition to the sun, so it's the latest Borexino collaboration results on neutrinos in the sun, 2018. Supernova 1987A, there is the famous 1213 from three detectors, Kamiokandi, IMD, and Bakasan. And most recently, Blazar TXS, TXS, and then the telephone number there, uh, picking up neutrinos from um, a Blazar as it goes through. So in addition to these three well-known cases, there is a whole new generation of detectors coming online. So Super K with gadolinium, uh, Juno, the GM Underground Neutrino Observatory, and then you have dark energy experiments like Xeon and other ones. These things are going to usher in a new generation of multi-purpose neutrino detectors designed to open up avenues for detecting what are currently unobserved neutrinos. So there's a shot of Juno uh, under construction. Uh, it's going to begin taking data later this year. Then we have sort of dual purpose dark matter experiments like Xeon. And then at the bottom there, we've got Super K with GD, uh, which is an ongoing now active experiment. And the reason why um, adding GD is important 
is because it gives you a new signal within super K. So normally you have an antineutrino come in, it hits a proton, uh, the positron comes out, you detect the Cherkinoff radiation coming out. But as part of that weak reaction, a neutron comes out. And the reason you put gadolinium in it is because it has the, one of the largest cross-sections for neutron capture uh, that is known. And so by picking up that neutron, that gadolinium comes in, uh, and then that gad excited gadolinium de-excites, sending out a gamma ray, and that gives you a new signal to use in your neutrino detectors that can be used for all kinds of purposes. So with super-K gadolinium, Simpson et al., the uh, super-K collaboration um, in November of 2019, so just a few months ago, took a look at the sensitivity of super-K with GD to low-energy antineutrinos, and I want to highlight uh, the text in yellow is there. So assuming a normal neutrino mass ordering, more than 200 events could be detected in the final 12 hours before core collapse for a 15 to 25 solar mass star at around 200 parsecs, which is representative of the nearest red supergiant to Earth, Alpha Ori, or Betelgeuse. And so here's already Betelgeuse that we're hitting once. Uh, and then later on in yellow there, a pre-supernova star could be detected by super KGD up to 600 parsecs away. And so like, wow, okay, how many stars is that? that one or is it just Betelgeuse? How many, how many massive star candidates do we have within uh, at least a kiloparsec and 600 parsecs? So the answer to that, if you include red and blue supernovae, um, uh, is about 31. And so this is sort of a mapping of where those 31 pre-supernova candidates are that are detectable uh, by super KGD, including Betelgeuse there. This is from a recent work. Uh, it's up on archive. We just got the referee report this morning. Uh, it'll be great. It was super positive. It'll be good. So we're going to come back to uh, these 31 later on when if these neutrino detectors detect uh, a signal, how can we identify which supernova it is? Okay, so that'll be identifying the progenitor uh, when we get there. So let's explore some of these recent theoretical results that provide a couple of things. Number one, they provide new targets for current, forthcoming, and future generations of neutrino detectors. Number two, they provide new estimates for the neutrino background, the cosmic background due to stars. And number three, and this is will be particularly relevant to Irina Gina, is they provide new opportunities for nuclear experiments uh, that will have a significant difference in the stellar evolution and their detection of the stellar evolution. Okay, that's a little bit on current neutrino astronomy. And so now I want to do a quickie on neutrino production in stars as a reminder for where those neutrinos come from. So stars <clears throat> lose energy by two mechanisms. They lose uh, energy by photons from the stellar surface and from neutrinos from the stellar interior. Okay. And so the cross-section for neutrinos is of the order of 10 to the minus 44, and the cross-section for photons is on the order of 10 to the minus 24. And so the uh, neutrinos with a very long mean free path just go booming straight out of the stellar core. Uh, the image there is representative of the sun, so these would be solar neutrinos. So given the radius of the sun, it takes on the order of about two seconds for a neutrino produced by PPCNO um, in the core to come booming out. Whereas photons do the lazy drunken walk and it takes somewhere on the order of 10,000, 100,000 million years, depending exactly what you want to assume for the opacity profile, to make it out uh, of the sun out of the photosphere. Okay, so those are the two loss mechanisms. One is on the surface, one is on the core, and that will be important later when we come back to it. So in the core, <clears throat> there are two broad classes of mechanisms that produce neutrinos. One is thermal processes. So um, this is just means you have enough energy thermally to when particles scatter or undergo a, re a reaction, they will re uh, produce some neutrinos. So these are fairly classic. These are fairly well-known thermal processes. So we have pair neutrinos, photoneutrinos. Those are the dominant ones in stars. Plasma neutrinos, a little more important in white dwarfs. Um, Bremstelung, occasionally important in white dwarfs, and then recombination uh, as you go from the continuum to the bound. And then the image there shows the uh, gives a sort of a map of the total neutrino loss rate 
mergs per gram per second for a pure carbon composition. Those are the regimes. They all contribute everywhere, but this is the regimes where uh, these particular processes will dominate. And the green line there is when a massive star is operating in balanced power. So this is where the uh, neutrino losses balances the energy generation rate uh, from strong and electromagnetic reactions. And this generally takes place in the pair regime. And so um, that is the most important processes for massive stars when we get there. In addition to thermal processes, there's also neutrinos and beta processes. Um, so you have electron captures, uh, a dominant process. And so I write it two ways there, uh, both in terms of the, the, the nucleon, uh, electron coming in, you have a weak reaction, charged boson there uh, into a different nuclei. Positron captures, electron emission, beta minus decay, positron emission, beta plus decay, depending on your choice of words there. And then one mechanism, de excitation. So you have an excited uh, nucleus that undergoes, uh, emits a Z naught, intermediate vector boson, neutral, to a lower energy state. Uh, that process is, is not taken care of in what I'm about to show, but I just want to put it out there that it is, it is a uh, potential new channel uh, for producing neutrinos from, in particular, massive stars. Okay. So that's a little quick review on where neutrinos come from. And now I want to make some stars. And so at this point, if this was a live talk, I would ask uh, how many people know what MESA is. And hopefully, maybe most people would raise their hand. <laughs> uh, and then I would look at the people who did not raise their hand, and I would say that this part of the talk is for you. Um, and maybe if you even do know what MESA is, maybe you'll learn a little something of what it is. So I have just a few slides on a stellar evolution instrument. And so the MESA source code is a set of software modules for stellar astrophysics that can be used either on their own uh, or combined uh, to solve the coupled equations governing 1D stellar evolution with an implicit finite volume scheme. So the image there is three, uh, three rows of the Jacobian matrix. Uh, so the left axis there is the equation for cell K. So everything in here is just for one cell. And then uh, across the horizontal is where you're coupling cell K with the previous cell, cell K minus one, cell K plus one. The, I don't know if you can see my cursor there. I'm gonna move my cursor in case somebody does see it. So this right here is the nuclear reaction. This is how the structure changes with the chemistry. Uh, and then these are your structure equations, your stellar evolution equations. And these off blocks here are how the structure and the nuclear reactions couple themselves, and then these off-diagonal blocks are the coupling due to various transport processes, okay? But I'm not gonna talk a lot about the MESA source code. What I really want to mention is about the MESA project. So these days, the MESA project uh, is handled by a group of about, one, two, three, four, five, of about 14, 15 developers. So this is, these are MESA developers. Uh, and in the middle there is sort of the geographic map of where MESA has impact. It's currently a community of about 1,000 on January 2020. And some of our more recent additions to MESA developers are listed on the top row. Uh, Meredith, Adam, Josiah, Ian. Uh, and then you have some clowns down at the bottom who've been at it for a while. So one of the ways that MESA project innovates. So what do we do that innovates? So one of the ways that we innovate is we put out an instrument paper uh, about every two years updating the capabilities of what MESA is. And so how is that working out? And so this is uh, the metrics, the bibliometrics, if you like, on a single slide. So the interior metric there is the uh, uh, Citation counts for the various MESA papers, MESA 1 in 2011, 2013, MESA 2, all the way up to MESA 5 in 2019. And there's a uh, histogram up and to the right, very nice, for the citations. Total citation is, is on the order of about 3,500. But, so these people write uh, their articles on using MESA. And then the question is, 
how often are those papers cited? So in other words, are, is the science that MESA enables, is that a value to the larger community? And so you take a look at the citations to papers that uh, cite MESA themselves. So it's one ring out, this is the, the, the double ring motif of the image. And there's about 50,000 uh, articles that cite papers that cite MESA. And so this sort of gives it an impact radius of about 15, that's 45,000 divided by about 3,000, 3,500 or so. Um, and so this is one metric of MESA having a larger impact other than those um, stellar jockeys who um, like stars. Uh, and MESA certainly has made it into the top five and top 10 for the various publication years. If you're interested in using MESA, one of the best things you can do is attend the MESA Summer School. Uh, we do it every year. Hopefully we'll do it this year or it's on the bubble. We shall see um, what happens here in the era of uh, COVID-19. Uh, but over the past, uh, we've been doing it since 2012. So over roughly the past nine years or so, we've had about 400 participants um, who are creating their own MESA infrastructure at about 50 institutions around the world. MESA is but one part of an ecosystem, a national ecosystem, that lies between the laboratory astrophysics that we do in GINA, that we do in IRENA. So these are nuclear reactions. They can also be chemical reactions. They can be opacity calculations, opacity experiments, excuse me. Um, so this is the laboratory astrophysics. And then you have a whole slew of telescopes, anything from Gaia to uh, Vera Rubin Observatory to Super KGD, which we just talked about. Uh, and so MESA is one cog in this software ecosystem that lies between what we do here on Earth and what we observe up in the sky. So I like to think MESA is a cog, a nice a big cog, but it is one cog in a national ecosystem. Okay, so now we wanna make some stellar models. We have a tool and now we're going to apply that tool uh, with an eye toward neutrinos. Okay, so the first thing you ought to check is, can I do the sun? We do observe neutrinos in the sun, so how do we do? Let's go ahead and do one. So these are referred to as standard solar models with MESA. Uh, and on the left is a image or a, a plot of the difference in the sound speed from helioseismology. That's the delta CR, as a function of the scaled radius of the star. So zero is the center, one is the outer radius, and then this is comparing the calculated sound speed versus what you get when you do a helioseismogic inversion. And we do this for two different compositions, um, uh, Anders Graves SS09, and then the Graves and Sandoval 1998. Uh, and the thing I want to impress upon you is how small the y axis values are. Okay, we're down into the thousandth of a decimal point. So this is a pretty good um, sound speed profile of the sun. But since we are interested in neutrinos, uh, I call attention to the table on the right. So neutrinos in the sun have various components. They come from PP, they come from beryllium, boron, nitrogen, and oxygen. The values to hit are over on the right. Those are the observed values, um, mostly from Borexino, uh, as presented by Wick Haxton et al. and then Belanti et al. 2014. So then the two middle columns are what we get with the MESA standard solar model for the two different compositions being considered. Okay. And you can take a look at those and say that's actually pretty good. So these numbers are not tuned. What you're tuning is, for example, the sound speed profile. So this is a, uh, this is a, a quote, natural result that comes out for taking a look at the sun. <coughs> and this result uh, was presented in Farag et al. It's out on Astro PH. It's in production in APJ, and it will be coming out here um, probably within the next month as a formal article. Uh, and so one reason, and the reason we want to do this is because I want a neutrino normalization. I want to know how, what the luminosity of neutrinos is coming out from the sun. And so most people don't know um, that the, the luminosity of the sun is on the order of about 1 50th of the photon luminosity leaving the surface. So L nu solar is about 0 0.024 L gamma solar. And in terms of numbers, that's roughly about 10 to the 32 ergs per second in neutrinos leaving the sun. 
and I will make great use of that. So that's the sun, that's great. Okay, check off, we can do the sun. Now let's do some other uh, masses. And so we run a grid of masses in Mesa and you can make things like this. Probably most people on this call have seen this graph approximately 10,000 times in our life. So this is a classic HR diagram. So on the uh, x-axis is the effect of temperature. So it's a theorist HR diagram. It's not a color magnitude diagram. Uh, temperature on the x-axis and the log of the photon luminosity on the uh, y-axis. And we do it for a number of masses at solar metallicity between one and 40. So this is a classic 110 years old. And so you don't mess with a classic. <clears throat> and I hope you can see where this is going. Okay, but what if you took this very classic diagram and instead of putting photons on the y-axis, what if you put neutrinos on the y-axis? What if you had a neutrino HR diagram? What would that even look like? I don't know. So let's do it. And bang. And so the left side is what you just saw. This is a traditional photon HR diagram. And on the right from Farag et al. 2020 is the, as far as we know, as far as we can tell, this is the very first neutrino HR diagram. So again, it's a surface property on the x-axis, the effective temperature. But now on the y-axis, instead of the photon luminosity, we're going to put the neutrino luminosity normalized by the solar uh, neutrino luminosity. That's why we just showed the standard solar model and what MESA does for um, the sun. So I'm not gonna walk through every phase of evolution here. There is a, uh, it's out on archive if you wanna take a look at it, where we do walk through every, every uh, evolution here and I will just broadly paint brush it. So stars, uh, instead of on the pre-main sequence as they come up, they come up from the bottom here, uh, then they will undergo an initial non-equilibrium burn because the initial CNO is not exactly what the CNO requires when you equilibrate and are on ZAMs, however that's defined. Okay, and then low mass stars uh, over here on the right, they will undergo their helium flash. You can see the, uh, these are from the uh, fluorine 18 neutrinos uh, popping up. They will continue their evolution. You will get the thermal pulses. These are the big green slices over here. And then they come out of the thermal pulses. They become quote, planetary nebula, <clears throat> and they go on over to become white dwarfs. Massive stars, on the other hand, go on up, and once you reach uh, um, carbon burning, this is when the massive stars become dominated by neutrinos, completely changes the time scale for their evolution, and they essentially, more or less, uh, go vertically up uh, in a neutrino HR diagram. And I label various um, ignition points there and various shell mergers that may be taking place, giving you those squiggly lines as you go up. Frank, so, we have a, a question in the, the chat, if you don't mind taking one now. Yeah, sure, tell me what it is. Um, the question was, what if you had a core temperature on the x-axis for your neutrino HR diagram, rather than the effective surface temperature? Uh, that's another option. Um, one could certainly do that. I wouldn't call it an HR diagram at that point, because uh, an HR diagram is traditionally the, the uh, surface temperature, the effective temperature. But one could certainly do that, and that gives you another, another space, another uh, viewpoint portal to look at this. Yep, that's an option. So there you go. So you're among the first people, after 110 years, <laughs> to take a look at a neutrino HR diagram. So you can ask yourself some questions there. We talked about the various mechanisms by which you produce neutrinos. There are beta processes and there are thermal processes and when do various processes dominate? So this is the neutrino HR diagram and when thermal reactions dominate, when, when thermal production of neutrinos dominates, those are colored green, and when nuclear reactions, weak reactions, dominate the neutrino production, those are colored sort of a tan color, and then you have the intermediate um, blue region. And so, uh, there's lots of things to study in that diagram, uh, but in general, the baseline conclusion coming out of that kind of question, the answer to that question, is that reactions tend to dominate whenever hydrogen or helium burn. Uh, they will be the dominant component to the neutrino losses. 
Other than that, it is thermal. So once you get into carbon and up, you tend to be dominated by thermal processes. Okay. And so uh, photons leave from the surface, neutrinos leave from the core. When does which one dominate? When do photons dominate and when do neutrinos dominate? So now I take my uh, neutrino HR diagram and I split it up uh, by mass. So on the left hand side is low mass stars, things less than about 10 or so. Uh, and on the right hand side is high mass stars. And this is just to help disambiguate the two within the neutrino HR diagram. And in general, neutrinos tend to dominate toward the end of a star's life. Otherwise, through most of the star's life, photons will be the dominant energy loss mechanism. Uh, but neutrinos will dominate at the end. And that is very interesting for the next generation of neutrino detectors. Okay. And so probing the evolution of pre-supernova models. What shall we see? And so this is the March to core collapse. This is from uh, Kelly Patton et al, 2017. Um, I'm gonna count this as relatively new, uh, in part because one of the things I want to show seems somewhat underappreciated and may give some targets for EFRIB coming up or uh, uh, other efforts on neutrinos and weak reactions. So on the left-hand side is the, uh, uh, the luminosity and number of neutrinos per second coming out. And on the x-axis there is the time to core collapse. So uh, 10 to the zero is one, so it's one hour before core collapse. Uh, there are various um, evolutionary stages shown there, oxygen shell burning, silicon core burning, silicon shell burning. Uh, and then they are uh, driven there by the lines there are whether it's from reaction neutrinos or thermal neutrinos. And it pretty much agrees with what we just saw in that neutrino HR diagram, is that uh, uh, thermal tends to dominate until you get to within about an hour or two of core collapse, and then the reaction neutrinos on isotopes begins to dominate. And this gives you a handle on being able to probe the isotopic evolution of massive stars as they go into collapse. And on the uh, right-hand side is a, um, the evolution of stars in the central temperature density plane. So somebody just asked about central temperature, so here it is in one representation. Um, and all those wiggles in there are, are, are real. Those are um, from when material ignites under de degenerate, electron degenerate conditions or otherwise. Uh, and there are various triangles on there. Uh, marking various points where very detailed calculations were done of the isotopic um, evolution in the neutrino signatures, which is sort of summarized in this plot here. These are beta processing rates that matter. Uh, and so isotopes listed for neutrino, these are mainly electron captures, and those for antineutrinos are mainly beta decay. And so, for example, let's, this is in the central uh, temperature density plane. So I have an arrow there. So at two hours before core collapse, uh, electron captures on iron-53 account for 17% of the neutrino signal. And similarly, uh, for antineutrinos, magnesium-56 accounts for 43% of the neutrino signal. And as we come down to the very end there with about uh, 0.06 seconds or so remaining, there's another list of uh, isotopes that dominate the pre-supernova neutrino signal. So there are some lovely tables, highly detailed, uh, in Patton et al, describing this at all those various triangles as the time goes on. And so I would like to hear from my experimental colleagues, uh, particularly as EFRIB comes online, that this is an explicit listing of reactions that matter. And so can these be done at EFRIB? Can these be done at other facilities? What is the theoretical state of these weak reaction rates in producing neutrinos? So um, there's a call out to my experimental colleagues. Um, thank so, you. Um, so these values, like the percentages that neutrinos are for whatever um, reaction, this is based off of the model. Mm -hmm. um, so the facilities that detect them, can they, like, do they know, like, the neutrino flux, like, the percentage that's coming from 
magnesium or iron or is that just like something that we just will use models for those you're going to have to use models for to uh you know the, the sensitivity to be able to basically do an isotopic splitting if you like to use optical astronomy terms is not there yet uh in neutrino telescopes so those okay. are going to come, those are going to come from models thanks but what you will be able to get are things like uh, this shot right here. Uh, do I show it? No. Okay. <clears throat> so also in Pat and Al, we took all that and we did, how, what is your flux at one KPC? Uh, so this is a spectrum on the uh, y-axis is the flux at Earth and on the y-axis is the energy of the neutrinos. So these are spectrums of the neutrinos. And each of the colored lines there is at different times. So several hours before collapse, uh, all the way up to the onset of core collapse. On the left, we plot the um, solar neutrinos. Okay, those are the gray lines. And just at zeroth order, okay, the neutrinos coming from these pre-supernova are of order the magnitude of what you get from the sun. So if we can detect solar neutrinos, we ought to be able to detect these pre-supernova neutrinos at distances of one kiloparsec. This is, happens to be for a 30 solar mass star, but it holds for other masses. Uh, and you get a slightly different answer if you take an inverted neutrino hierarchy. <clears throat> on the right-hand side uh, is the anti-neutrino signal, and also on there are sources of what would be noise relative to the neutrino telescope. So you have things like nuclear reactors on Earth. They form a source of background noise. And the Earth itself is, is uh, a neutrino generator. These are the geoneutrinos. And so in general, these sources of noise, these background sources of noise are lower than the curve, so that's good. So your sources of noise are less than the signal, okay? So this is at one KPC, and as we briefly saw, there's um, several stars that are closer than 31, to be precise, um, closer than one kiloparsec. And so this prompted Pat and Al in 2017, before Betelgeuse dim, before Super K got all, uh, excited about it, is we called out that, that um, we call out Betelgeuse, you know, it's 200 parsecs. And so uh, a neutrino signal from Betelgeuse is gonna be practically background free in energy windows that are realistic for detection. And you can detect them for several hours, possibly up to 10 hours before the core collapse event. Okay. And so this is where Simpson et al, picked it up, uh, and on, this is their plots, this is Simpson and this is not my plots, this is, uh, so IBD there stands for inverse beta decay. So this is the inverse beta decay rate as a function of time to core collapse. Uh, and by the time you get uh, up around 100 or so events, um, you're already about 10 hours before um, core collapse for uh, Betelgeuse. And then the image on the, or the plot on the right here is the inverse beta decay rate, uh, the spectrum. And so where, where do you expect it to peak? And so what's really interesting about um, pre-supernova neutrinos is they can give a heads up to the electromagnetic and gravitational wave communities that a pre-supernova is imminent. Okay, that's important. Um, in the past, Neutrinos have sort of always been on the backside of it. The event has happened and, oh, here's the neutrinos after the fact. But pre-supernova and the current technology of neutrino detectors actually gives us an, or can give us an early warning signal um, that could be sent uh, should something be detected. Okay, so this is an exciting new science capability. And again, uh, I would like to engage my um, experimental colleagues within Gina Irina to take a look at some of those weak reaction rates that matter uh, and see if we can narrow down uh, what that signal could be. There are a few uh, questions in the chat if you don't mind taking some now. Yeah, sure. um, so first, uh, how extreme or energetic does a neutrino event need to be for us to detect it from Betelgeuse? Uh, let's see, that would be answered, uh, okay, how extreme, um, I'd say, let me answer it this way, anything between uh, 15 and 30 solar masses, and I'll get to what Betelgeuse is, um, is definitely detectable within a kiloparsec. 
So it need not be extreme, it just needs to be sort of a garden variety massive star anywhere between 10 and 30 solar masses and we will be able to detect it. So it doesn't require unusual conditions, I guess is the, the nature of the question. Not at all. And uh, what are the model uncertainties in the neutrino fluxes? Um, uh, on the pre-supernova side, uh, there, okay, so as usual, when anybody asks what the uncertainty is, that's always sort of a rat's nest. You can go down forever. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know. So let me answer it this way. So on this plot, this is from uh, Simpson and I'll take a look at the, the left plot. There's a variety, two different models there, uh, one from Pat and Al, uh, and one from uh, some from my Polish colleagues. And you can take that spread. So for example, let's take a look at the 15 solar mass of Betelgeuse, that'd be the difference between yellow and blue. And so that's sort of, if you like, it's representative of the model uncertainties. These were calculated with two different stellar evolution codes with two different sets of rates. Blah, 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 blah. Um, and so you can take this difference between the yellow and blue as sort of representative of what that uncertainty might be. Okay, a um, little bit larger on, uh, on the 30 between the pink and green. So if you like that, you can take that as the measure of the uncertainty. And so one of the nice things about if we do detect these neutrinos coming in from pre-supernova is we should be able to uh, decipher um, uh, which of the various classes of models will be right and then from the experimental colleagues be able to tell which isotopes are actually dominating. And for this uh, pre-supernova alert, do we get any pointing information from these pre-supernova? What a great or? question. What okay. a fantastic question. We just got the referee report on this this morning, right, Um And it was great, it was super positive. We got some minor things, clean up, typos or misunderstandings, no big deal. So how do we identify the progenitor? What a great question. So yes, oh, Super K detects, you know, pre-supernova neutrinos and they send out an alert to the gravitational and electromagnetic communities and which one is it? Because the sky's pretty big. So the question that I wanna answer here uh, is, is because your only signal is gonna be coming from the neutrino telescopes and neutrino detectors, how good of a job can you do um, identifying the progenitor from that, okay? So on the left, uh, you have got an anti, uh, if you like the squiggly uh, interaction diagram there. We have a uh, anti-neutrino, electron neutrino coming in. It's gonna pop some proton in the detector. Off is gonna come the positron. The neutron will go out. The neutron will be in a uh, high energy uh, neutron. And it's gonna have to um, thermalize before it uh, reacts with, let's say, the, the gadolinium or whatever your additive is to the um, liquid scintillator before it releases a gamma. And so when you measure these, you have information on where the electron positron annihilation point was, that's up here in blue. You know, uh, you'll be able to reconstruct where the gamma, the photon is left out from the neutron, and then that gives you a vector between those two and that vector between the electron positron and where the neutron emits its photon, this is giving you directional information about where the uh, event is coming from. And this is essentially the essence of the method, okay? So from your detector, you can derive directional information. Okay, so standard liquid scintillators, abbreviated LS in the upper plot, um, depending on your signal to noise ratio, so that's alpha in these plots. So alpha of, of an infinity means um, no noise. That's kind of optimistic, <laughs> okay? And signal to noise ratios of 10 uh, and three. And so each of those curves there corresponds to uh, various signal to noise ratios. Orange there is for detecting something at a confidence level of, of 90% uh, and uh, blue there in, um, for a 68% confidence level. So in general, in very broad terms, uh, you can localize the supernova, which supernova is going off, which massive star is going off uh, with standard liquid scintillators up to about 70 degrees. So roughly you could eliminate roughly half the sky, um, which is still useful information. Uh, oh, and on the uh, x-axis there is the number of events, kind of chopped off on my screen. Um, so this is, uh, 
100 events, 200 events, 300 events. So by the time you get up to about 200 events, which would be kind of typical um, uh, for what you'd want to be able to issue a alert, alert you can uh, eliminate the sky down to about uh, half the sky, a little less than half the sky. On the other hand, you can do things to enhance your liquid scintillator detector. You could put lithium in, for example, because lithium has a great neutron capture cross-section. And again, for 68% confidence level, 90% confident level, um, uh, you can get your localization down to about 15 degrees. Okay, so that's much better. And let's take a very specific example in this paper, which is on Astro pH. Uh, we, do, we do four named sources. I think that's partially what makes this work um, a lot more accessible and even some of the earlier ones, right? And rather than just doing sort of nebulous calculations on stellar evolution and ifs and ifs, actually name the star, right? We're gonna do Betelgeuse. So I'm gonna do Antares here, okay? So Antares resides at a lovely distance of about 0.17 parsecs. That's a lot closer to one kiloparsec. Um, uh, and mass estimates uh, are about 15 solar masses and very detailed uh, references are given in uh, Manick's paper, et al, 2020, on where those distances and mass estimates come from. So these are uh, Molenweed plots, uh, and in the upper left here is four hours before collapse. On the right here is one hour before collapse, and then on the bottom left here is two minutes before collapse. And the point here is what are the error circles, right? How much of the sky can I eliminate? So on all these plots, the orange stands a 95% confidence limit, confidence level detection. And red here is 65% for standard liquid scintillators. That's LS, liquid scintillators, okay? Uh, and so for standard liquid scintillators, you can see that as you get closer and closer and the signal gets larger and larger and you're only using your neutrino telescope, right? Um, you can eliminate more than half the sky for a standard liquid one. If you wanna put some lithium in there and get an enhanced, um, liquid scintillator, these are the purple and black. So even four hours before collapse, if you had an enhanced liquid uh, scintillator, um, you could narrow down even at the 95% uh, that it's, well, it's either Ontario's or it's something else, right? So now you've just eliminated it down to two possible events and they're both localized within the same region of the sky. And within one hour, you've almost eliminated the other candidate, and by the time you get to two minutes, you have identified Antares as the pre-supernova going off. And of course, this is incredibly valuable information for the electromagnetic and gravitational wave communities that this is where it's coming, gonna be coming from, beware. Um, and so we do this for a number of different stars. We do it for Betelgeuse, of course, because Betelgeuse is the theme of this talk. Um, Antares and um, two other stars that I'll let you take a look at. Okay, but we go through the exercise here of how do you de identify um, that progenitor? It's a great question. Pre-supernova are great. <clears throat> They're probably the ones we're gonna um, detect first. Uh, but low mass stars count too. <laughs> In fact, there's more low mass stars than any of them. The sun being an example, we detect the sun. Uh, so what might be, what might be one? Um, so there are two peaks that stick out. So you're looking for big numbers here on the, on the y-axis because those are the ones going to be the easiest to detect. And so for low mass stars, the peaks come up uh, around the um, um, helium burning driven thermal pulses where you will reach neutrino luminosities of about 10 to the 9, a billion times the solar neutrino luminosity. And again, most of these come from the fluorine 18 E plus new 18O reaction. Okay. And so uh, that gives you a flux uh, scaled to 10 parsecs. The time scales for detecting these from, from low mass stars is about a tenth of a year. That's roughly how long a thermal pulse will last. Uh, model, a little model dependent there, but you know, of order a tenth of a year. And the average energy, which is inside the uh, detector. Um, current detector technology is about 0.3 MeV, right? Because we do detect these from the sun. The other one uh, to go after 
is potentially the helium flash. So this is down here. This is uh, reaching luminosities is about 10 to the four. So yes, you do lose on the total luminosity, but if the star is closer, you might win. Okay, so it's these two, it's these peaky areas, thermal pulses and helium flashes. And again, it's the same reaction, 18F going to 18 ohm. Uh, time scales here are longer, so you win a little bit that way. They last three days. You got days to get it instead of, uh, you know, a tenth of a year. Um, and then you have the average neutrino energy. So low mass stars are a candidate. Unfortunately, there's no great nearby targets for either the helium flash or the thermal pulse. So what the plot here is showing is a function of time. So zero is now. Uh, versus the heliocentric distance of nearby stars. Okay. So at zero currently, as we all probably know, Alpha Cen AB plus Proxima is the closest star system to the sun. But that was not always the case in the past, and it will not be the case in the future, right? Because all these stars are orbiting the galactic potential. Um, and so stars will come and go within uh, a couple of parsecs of the sun. Uh, and unfortunately, none of the stars listed here, and of course you can take this calculation out to about a million years, somewhat reliably, um, both in the past and in the future, uh, preferably future, because we have neutrino detectors. <laughs> um, um, and there's no really, you lose a little bit, although massive, or although low mass stars, there's a lot more of them, they also have a much longer time scale. And that's kind of what, what kills you as they move around in the galactic potential. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's worth mentioning, things do happen, serendipity happens, but I just want to call out that pre-supernova are not the only game in town uh, for detecting neutrinos. And <clears throat> with that, um, after all this talk on uh, neutrinos, and depending on what time zone you're in, or heck, no matter what time zone you're in, uh, it's probably time to go out and enjoy a neutrino cocktail, whether you wish to toast massive stars, pre-supernova stars or um, low mass stars. So I want to thank you very much for your uh, time and attention on this um, seminar. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. Um, I think we've got lots of time for questions if there are any out there in the audience. Feel free to speak up or raise your hand. Hi, Frank. This is uh, Sherwood. Hi, Sherwood. Uh, <clears throat> I'm interested in, in your, that just the last plot you had about low mass stars, um, and uh, they all have these like uh, parabolas to them, and they're all at the bottom of the parabola. What am I supposed to understand from these parabolic shapes? That they're in orbit. They are in orbit about the galactic center, ultimately. Okay. Um, so, so some are, so these are, these are local differences in the, in the velocity, right? This is the velocity, the local, um, velocity dispersion, and so stars are moving at different speeds, they're in slightly different orbits. This is what this plot is telling you at zero order. Stars are moving around. And they're all, uh, it, it looks like they're all serendipitously at the closest point in their orbits, is that? Oh, that's just where I put the dot. Ah, uh, okay, okay. That's just a random, I just, that's just graphical purposes. I put the dot there, <laughs> because okay. you're interested in where, where is the closest approach? Right, so the closest approach, okay. Alpha Sen, is going to be in about ten, fifteen thousand years. Is when Alpha Sen will actually be as close. So Alpha Sen is moving toward us right now, and it will reach the closest distance at about uh, in about ten thousand years, and then it will start moving away. So I put the dots there on where it hits closest approach. I see. Does that make more sense now? Yes, yes, very much. Thank okay. you. Got it. Yeah, I should put that on there. Dot equal closest approach. All right, we have a raised hand from uh, Chuck Horowitz. Hey, Chuck. Uh, so, great, am I? Uh, so, I uh, wanted to ask about um, asteroid seismology modes for, for pre-supernova stars. Uh-huh. So, so, obviously, neutrinos would be a great um, uh, warning uh, if you saw them. Um, but uh, what happens to, to the... Uh, seismology modes uh, as, as the star approaches the... So yeah, that's currently a topic of um, active research interest, right? So people are interested in tapping 
Uh, Elliot did a number of works on this, just noting out that through acoustic waves, you can tap the energy in the core uh, and move it out to the outer regions of the star. And so whether this gives you pulsational signals, um, astroseismology signals, this is a, an active topic. And this may be another possible detection mechanism of um, seismology uh, from massive stars tapping the energy of the core and putting it on the outside. All right, we have another raised hand from uh, Raphael Lind. Hey Frank, great talk, thank you very much. Um, so Sam, this, this helium flash thing, that's news to me. So if this is spread out so much, we don't currently, neutrino telescopes wouldn't really trigger on that, would it? I mean, we're all looking for this short stuff. So really what this argues for is a new coincidence mode where we integrate over a couple days and look for uh, an elevated back, uh, count over background. Well, that's, a great, that's a great point, right? Like we're all focused on, you know, the 10 seconds of core collapse, <laughs> right? 87A is 10 seconds. Right. Uh, there, you know, there's hours of events going on beforehand. And if you want to consider, um, uh, depending as far down as you go, right? Days in the case of low mass stars. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, there's a whole time baseline that we haven't explored yet. Right? We're all interested in the big firework, but there may be a lot of other stuff in a lo longer time domains that might be worth looking at for, from neutrino detectors. That's a great point. Uh, work to do. Yes. All right, and then a question from Alex. Hey Frank, I'm wondering, you know, we're, we're out of this regime right now, of course, but um, when you have the neutrino spectra from these, is there anything interesting that you learn? I missed that. Could you repeat that? Sorry. Uh, when you have the energy spectrum for the these, is there something interesting? Um. Okay. Um. Blah, 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 blah. Within the pre-supernova, there's not a signal like a spectral line, right? Uh, unlike the sun. So on the left here, right, that's got a pretty clear spectral line, so very definite um, weak reactions taking place. Here you don't get that. Uh, it's more of a smooth distribution uh, because you're sampling a variety of temperatures um, and conditions where the neutrinos are produced. But where it does matter is get to that earlier plot where I showed, okay, 17% of the neutrinos come from um, uh, you know, iron 54 or magnesium 56, whatever it may be. And so this will modulate the amplitude, you know, the amplitude of these. Um, and so in that sense, there can be some um, hints as to what the composition might be. So in that sense, it's kind of like a line, but a little different. You get, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, that, that's helpful. Thanks. Okay. All right. Any more questions? If not, I have one. Um, do you have any sense about how this neutrino HR diagram might change with multidimensional effects, convection, rotation, things like that? Um, no, I have no great clue. Um, uh, I think, well, okay, I have some clue. Huh? <laughs> I think the general order of magnitude of the size of the signal is not going to change. And I'm not going to argue factors of two. I don't, it's not worth talking about. But where the multi D effects may come in, uh, it may come in on, for example, the placement of where these lines are, at least in a traditional HR diagram where you have effective temperature on there. So exactly where the lines lie, uh, it can definitely move around. It's also possible while I've drawn just, drawn just a line here, uh, that the multi-dimensional effects will add some width to those lines uh, because they will be able to pick up the different spatial um, components. It may be that, as I've indicated there, you can see some of those shell mergers or indicated shell mergers where all of a sudden it gets real ratty as it goes back and forth a little bit. Um, and of course, this is a, this is a, 
this is a forefront topic currently. People doing multi-D pre-supernova stars is these various shell mergers that takes place. And so it could be that there'll be a lot more, and that's what I mean by the width. So the, the width uh, of these things could get a lot larger. You're sampling different regions at different temperatures at different densities as you have up plumes and down plumes. Um, so yeah, overall placement and the wiggle back and forth, uh, I think are the primary where multi-D may come in. On the other hand, I notice we have a number of multi-D um, supernova experts on this call. So if you want to do something different in forefront, and maybe it's just pre post-processing what you already got, <laughs> right? Put out what what are the what are the impacts of of multi-D effects on a neutrino HR diagram, on what you might expect from something from Betelgeuse or on Taris or any of the 31 that are close. Um, yeah, that would be great, great to go after. Thanks, for, like that. Thanks for that call to arms. So <laughs> I'm calling my arms to my experimental colleagues to tell me whether any of this stuff is doable with current or future, near future detectors and then my uh, theory colleagues, yeah, get out your multi-D and tell me how wrong this is, um, or how different it is, I should say. But oh, I'm glad to be told I'm wrong, too. That, that works well, too. <clears throat> All right, I think we have a question from Zach as well. Hey, Frank, so apologies if I uh, missed this because I have my junior research uh, assistants with me today. But um, You have a little neutrino there. Yeah, a little one. Yeah, the other little one sitting next to me eating a snack. But um, the question I have is, I think most of the talk that I caught anyways focused on using these pre-supernova neutrinos as a warning mechanism. Mm -hmm. Is there, there complementary physics you can extract from the neutrino signal that you maybe necessarily wouldn't get, or maybe you would get it from the gravitational yeah. waves, but this would be complementary. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know at what point you were freed from your uh, small it was, it was intermittent. <laughs> For example, this is this is one where we in in patented out we give some very detailed tables on the top ten isotopes at uh, about roughly seven or eight times, uh, and these are targets for then experiments to go after. So these are the kinds of things um, that I think get where you're going with that question. I think. Yeah. Thanks. And that neutrino blipped out. Okay. All right. I don't see any more questions. Uh, so cool. thank you, Frank, for the great talk. Uh, you've given thank us all you. a lot of work to do, clearly. <laughs> well, I hope it opens yeah. up a whole new, right? So I'll make one comment, right? So people 30 years ago were calculating gravitational wave signals when Joe Weber's aluminized disk were rattling around, right? And so people go, why are you doing this? You're never going to detect these things. Well, here we are. <laughs> Right? And so you don't know when those technology breakthroughs are going to happen for neutrino detectors. And so my feeling is sort of now is the time to lay down your predictions on where the next neutrinos are going to come to be. So maybe neutrino neutron astronomy is the next gravitational wave astronomy breakthroughs. So now is the time to, to lay it all down. So let's do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, and uh, we have another seminar, not in two weeks, but uh, May 8th. Um, I'm gonna hear from Professor Ezzedine at uh, University of Florida. So hopefully you can all 